I was like sitting there on a stump waiting for a deer to walk past. And I was like, this is not what would be in a magazine. Instead of having the heavy lure to pull the line out, in fly fishing, the weighted line is used to pull the fly out. There's only one streamer that I think needs to be in the box of every fly fisherman, regardless of uh, skill level, and that would be just a black or olive woolly bugger. Something else to mention is that fly fishing is not as expensive as people make it sound. There's no reason to spend a bunch of money when you're just getting started. They'll be hearing about it, you know, over time. And then at some point, they'll probably realize like, wow, I know more about this than I thought I did. It's really hard to have a bad time when you're doing that. Like, it's just plain fun. This is Katie Berger with Fish Untamed, and you're listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. I've been blessed to harvest 22 of the 29 North American animals with my bow. My personal 24-hour record for death threats is 88. They will start putting two and two together and realize this is how you call bulls in. So when I go hunting now, that's the ethos I take with me. You know, whatever whatever this hunt is going to throw at you, you pull your big girl pants up and you get on with it. Giant bucks are freaking awesome. They're beautiful. But you know what? I would not trade this first puck for anything in the world. So I'm really, I'm a geek. Magicians and dragons and magic swords. <laughs> I shit you not, man. I'm the biggest dork in the gun business. I'm Freddie Hartice, Hollywood Hunter. This is Aaron Snyder. Hey, this is Trevin Stoltzfus with Outback Outdoors. This is Rihanna Carey. Hi, this is John Sloan of the Interviews with the Haunting Masters. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey, y'all, welcome to episode 120 of The Wild Initiative. The Wild Initiative is brought to you in part by the Go Wild app. Y'all, I'm out here busting my butt hiking through the Montana high country trying to locate elk that are just not talking, and it is getting very frustrating. But one of the really cool things about being out here is that I have been tracking all of my hunts using my Garmin watch in sync with the Go Wild app. And while I may not be seeing any elk, one of the really cool things is being able to, at the end of the day, sync all of my data and go through my day's hunt and really check out all of the rather significant work I've been putting in throughout my time in the backcountry. And if y'all wanted to follow along, you can log in and check out my profile on the Go Wild app and pretty much follow along step by step with me as you scroll through my hunts that I've shared. You get everything in a really digestible format that's super detailed. You get all these awesome pictures that I've been taking along my hunts. You can see the topo. And as you scroll through, you can even feel my heart rate as I repeatedly abuse my body for something I am not even close to conditioned enough for. (laughs) It's a really awesome in-depth summary of everything you've been doing in your hunt. So I want you to all head over to the Go Wild app and make sure you've been checking out my last several days of elk hunting and follow along with all the craziness and stress that I've been putting my body through. You can find that at thewildinitiative.com slash go wild. Also, y'all, I want to send a huge shout out to Sawyer Products for their continued support of the podcast. Y'all, I have been using their products, especially their insect repellent and water filtration, the entirety of my elk hunt. And I can tell you it is absolutely bulletproof. It is the kind of gear that keeps keeps you in the outdoors for longer. So make sure y'all head on over to Sawyer.com and check them out. All right, y'all getting on to today's episode. I had an incredible time recording this episode because this is something that I have really been wanting to learn more about and I haven't gotten much of a chance to touch on yet in the podcast. Today I have Katie Burgert of Fish Untamed and we get to have a really awesome discussion about fly fishing. And when I say discussion, I mean we cover absolutely everything you need to know to get started fly fishing, especially if you want to include fly fishing as part of your backcountry hunts. I really think y'all will enjoy this episode, especially if you are as interested in getting into fly fishing as I am. We really touch on some great stuff, and if you're anything like me, by the end of this episode, you will be pulling into the first tackle shop that you happen to drive by. Also, make sure y'all listen to this episode all the way through to the end because I have a really exciting announcement uh, that Katie and I talk about towards the end of the episode. So make sure you tune in and enjoy episode 120 with Katie Burgert of Fish Untamed. All right, y'all. Welcome to another episode of the Wild Initiative. Katie, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. So always like to start out with initially just a little bit of background, you know, how you got your start in the outdoors and especially fly fishing. 
Uh, the outdoors is, I don't, I feel like a lot of people get their start, you know, through family or, or, you know, a mentor or something, but growing up, I just, I took to a fishing rod as, as early as I can remember, not through a parent or anything, but I was an only child. So I needed something to keep myself occupied. So I'd go out and fish for bass and stuff. And I would go days without catching anything, but <laughs> I just like loved being out there and, you know, being in the water and everything. So I grew up just spin casting for, for bass and walleye and stuff like that. And uh, it wasn't until college that I picked up fly fishing, um, kind of a, a strange story, but my sister lived out in Colorado. I was from Pennsylvania and she had called me one day and was like, I work with this guy. She's a teacher. And so, uh, she worked with a guy who over the summer would, would guide, um, out here in Colorado. And he was like, do you know anyone who likes to fish? We need some help in the fly shop out here. And, you know, I told her, I don't, fly fish, but I'd be happy to come out and, and mm -hmm. learn if, if they need some help. So I just came out on a whim one summer and kind of worked the fly shop out there and learned from people working there and haven't really looked back since I, I came out every summer uh, during college to do that. And then by the end of it, I just stayed in Colorado and haven't picked up a spin rod much since, but I, I still do occasionally because I still find it fun. <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, I've been wanting to pick up fly fishing for I mean, basically since I started hunting, you know, because they, they definitely go hand in hand, they especially, do, yeah. you know, with going, like doing the Western hunting, the mountain hunting, there's so many incredible places to go fly fishing. Um, but it's definitely one of those things where I'm like, oh, I want to so bad, but yeah, that's a whole nother skill set that I'm, <laughs> I'm still developing. I mean, I already took on enough with like archery, with hunting and archery hunting. and then I'm like, let's see, I want to, I want to try and learn a whole additional skill set. Um, and while by, you're still learning, yeah. yeah, a whole nother set of gear. I'm like, maybe I should, I very rarely do things the wise way, but I decided to, uh, maybe I'll take a short, uh, short break <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and pick this up in a couple of years. Once, you know, I wouldn't say once I've, I've mastered hunting, but once I'm not completely clueless about it. Right. Didn't you say that you, uh, that no one should take the route toward hunting that you did because you just kind of jumped in head first. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I always tell people, I'm like, if that's what you want to do, don't let anybody tell you, you can't do it. Like if that is what you're passionate about and you want to do it, find a way to do it, you know? And I know people that their first hunt was an archery elk hunt. Um, or, or I should say like their first big game hunt was an archery elk hunt. And, uh, they were successful, you know, not everyone will have the same experience I did. Everyone, everyone's different, but you know, word to the wise, I'd say, start, start small and, uh, build on experiences rather than going for the giant experience <laughs> first thing off. Right. I think that's why a lot of kids don't start with fly fishing. And, and I've heard plenty of avid fly fishermen say like, yeah, I would not start my child fly fishing. Like, even though that's what I do, like it, it takes time to work up to it and there's no shame in, you know, starting slow and, and working up to it over time. So would you say that, uh, starting, starting fishing, you know, it's, it's, you know, with hunt, with hunting, say, you know, a lot of people, you can go do small game, you can go do upland game with, with shotguns, and then you can move on to maybe big game with rifles and you can move on to bow hunting, things like that. Would that would that almost kind of be equivalent to maybe starting uh, fishing with a spinning reel, then maybe moving up to like a bait caster, and then moving into fly fishing? Would that be an apt kind of description? For sure, and like I've got a couple couple like tangents to take this off in too. But I was like I was just talking to my cousin the other day, and he just got his first bait caster, and he had uh, like a bird's nest immediately, you know, just because there's <laughs> you know got to use your tension and. I actually had never thought of that before, but it, there's a very similar thing in fly fishing where the reel is just kind of there to hold the line and you're kind of in charge of being your own drag at times. I mean, there's a drag on the reel, but uh, it's something you don't think about with spin fishing a lot because the, the reel's doing a lot of the work for you. Um, so having that progression is, is definitely helpful. And, you know, spin fishing is great as well for learning how fish operate and where to find fish. And a lot of a lot of fly fishing uses, you know, techniques learned spin fishing because the hardest part is learning where fish are, what they eat, how they behave. Um, it's not that hard to learn a technique of, of how to cast a line. Um, and even within fly fishing itself, 
there's definitely a progression. So I think it's great to start um, maybe a, a, like a local pond and fishing for something like bluegill. Cause I don't know if, I don't know if you've done much like pan fishing, but it's not hard to get them to eat. So like practice on something small like that. And then you can work up to, you know, a trout in like a big river. Yeah. I mean, I grew up, so I grew up fishing. I mean, basically the same lake in the, the same area, you know, like the, basically even the same two spots on that lake uh, you know, since I was probably three years old and I really hadn't done much else in that. Like I tried my hand at ocean fishing with my grandpa. We went a few times and I think we only ever caught one fish the entirety of the time we went out. But, um, I, I want to say it was last year when I was on my, uh, when I was down in Arizona, I went out, uh, with my buddies at the time. Um, uh, and you know, we just grabbed a, we just grabbed a crate full of gear, a package of hot dogs, and went out to one of the cattle ponds and uh, went jigging for uh, um, uh, jack pulling for bluegill. And that was just, I mean, that was just fun. You know, we just, it was so relaxed and and chill. And we just throw cut up the hot dogs, throw a little bit on the end of the line, and you'd throw it in. And I mean, you couldn't even, you couldn't even let it sink before one of them would hit on it and take right. it. Right throw it back in and and it's really hard to have a bad time when you're doing that like Mm -hmm. it's just plain fun so I feel like that is also like a good progression like so many people are intimidated by kind of the pretentious attitude of a lot of fly fishermen out there and and feeling like they need to be in this like a river runs through it scene with (laughs) full trout and mountains and stuff and it's like that is super fun and definitely something to work up toward, but like there's absolutely no shame in going out to your local pond with, you know, a lawn chair and, and just picking off bluegills. I fully equate that to the archery elk. Cause that's like, <laughs> that is like the full on, you know, you get this picture, this like full, like Donnie Vincent picture of the archery elk hunter in the snow and the mountains and, you know, the winds blowing through and he's got the rack on his back and he's trudging, you know, that whole right. thing. And, you know, that same kind of thing, it's like with the fly fishing, you know, you've got that very dramatic kind of sun, sunrise or sunset picture in the background with the, the river and, you know, the, uh, you know, up to his knees in the, in the waders and that perfect, you know, yep. <laughs> that perfect arc in the, in the line as he's casting or the, you know, that picture of the, the trout, like jumping up and grabbing, hitting the fly really <laughs> I like, I totally equate those two together. And if people get those romantic ideas, I think, and they just want to immediately jump there, kind of like me. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I mean, it's definitely like, when you get to that point, you're like, I made it, you know, but (laughs) more of your time is spent like untangling your line and (laughs) you know, getting hooks unstuck from yourself as you're learning to cast. And I feel like so many people get frustrated and they stop because they're stuck in that point. But like, like you said with archery hunting, like I just went on my first like real archery hunt and I was like sitting there on a stump waiting for a deer to walk past. And I was like, this is not what would be in a magazine. <laughs> <laughs> I would say 90% of what I do hunting is so definitely not what would be in a magazine. Ever. <laughs> that's like the, that's like the, the entirety of my hunting experience is like that first, like three sentences of the the article when they're like, yeah, man, we had a really rough week hunting. And then they go into the actual, like the cool part of the story. <laughs> right. You're like, I never left that part. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm the first three sentences of that, uh, that hunting article. <laughs> Maybe there should be a new magazine that comes out. That's just like the realist part of everything where they just explain like how things actually are. I think so- that's my blog. <laughs> <laughs> so the average person can relate and be like, yeah, okay. I've been there. <laughs> Um, so uh, talking about that kind of getting into hunting or getting into hunting, getting into fishing, you know, we talk about, okay, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you do want to start, uh, you know, just finding a, a pond, jack pulling for bluegill or, um, you know, doing something simple, uh, you know, like I did, I grew up, uh, fishing for rainbow trout with the same tackle for gosh, 30 some years in the same lake and you know I knew how to set up a rod and reel and stuff like that but so kind of what's you know somebody wants to start getting into more uh, to different types of fishing and and expanding their horizons a little bit where do they go from there so there's a a couple different routes I'd say you could take Um, obviously if you know someone that's probably the easiest 
route in, but a lot of people, like if they knew someone, they would already be into it. Um, a lot of people recommend going to a local fly shop, which is definitely one option, especially because a lot of shops nowadays are doing uh, either free or very cheap classes that teach you like some 101. But the problem that I find, um, I found it with archery too, is that you don't know what you don't know. So you feel really intimidated when you go in and don't even know what to ask because you know, most of the people in the shop at least have a background of terminology and at least a little bit of theoretical knowledge so they can, they can explain what it is they want to know more about. But mm -hmm. if you're going in for the first time completely clueless, you know, it, it can be really intimidating. So I would actually say the, the very best way to start would be to um, spend an hour or two online um, first looking up like the gear and the terminology that you don't know, because uh, if you don't know that, watching a video is going to be kind of confusing. <laughs> I'd say that once you know um, kind of what the difference between fly fishing and spin fishing is, uh, what the different gear is and what, it's each, what each thing is used for, then you can just go on. Like Orvis has a great learning center online where they go through 101 um, for people who've never touched a fly rod before and kind of explain the cast, the flies, the techniques, things like that. And if you already have uh, at least a little bit of knowledge on the terminology and the tackle, then what they're saying is going to make a lot more sense. And then I think once you've watched, you know, an hour or two of video, um, you'll already have enough knowledge to go out and give it a try in your backyard if you want. You might not have the gear yet, but um, at least at that point, if you go into a fly shop, you'll be able to um, talk your way through a conversation and figure out what the next step should be for you. So I'd say start online and then after a couple hours, head into a fly shop and they can take it from there. Well, I think in, in anything, you know, and one of the problems I had when I first started hunting was you almost don't know what questions to ask. Like right. yeah, people make themselves available and it's great, but it's, it's tough like to go up to someone and be like, okay, you know, I want to learn to fly fish. And they're like, all right, what questions do you have? And you're like, uh, I, what is it? What, yeah. <laughs> you know, how do I start fly fishing? <laughs> like, what are all the things I need to know for fly fishing? That's my question. Right. <laughs> Everything. Fill me with the knowledge yeah. you have. <laughs> and that's when they go, oh, I got to help this other customer. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's just, it's, it's really tough. And, and so one thing I noticed that I started doing is, um, between listening to podcasts and watching videos online, I, you know, there would be a lot of those terms that would continually come up. And, you know, I wouldn't always remember to do it. But, you know, I'd, I'd pull open like the notes app on my phone or, you know, have like a little notepad or something, you know, my backpack. And I just scribble things down. And I'm trying to even remember, you know, what, what some of them are, but uh, just those like little terms and, and stuff that, they come up, you're like, okay, they said that like nine times. And I just have no idea in the context of this, what it means. And, you know, then you can start looking that stuff up and that helped me a lot. And then I was able to, uh, like you said, get enough knowledge to where I knew the questions that I needed to go ask about gear, things like that. And it's, it also makes it a lot easier. Like when you're talking about something like, okay, I need the thing, uh, you know, the pants, the rubber pants that you put on to keep yourself from getting wet. <laughs> you know, you don't have to like weirdly describe things when you go right. and know how to ask for them. Even if you don't know what they're used for, you know what they're called and like someone then could teach you what they're used mm -hmm. for. And that's a good point because I didn't even think of that, but I actually used podcasts a lot getting into hunting, especially archery because I grew up um, whitetail hunting a bit and, you know, just sitting at the base of a tree with a rifle you know there wasn't much technique involved it's just you shoot it when it comes by <laughs> um so coming out here to not only get into archery hunting but also you know rifle elk is completely different from a rifle whitetail hunt back just east. a little bit just a just a tad bit different um and i just started listening to a bunch of hunting podcasts because i was just interested in it and half the stuff they said i didn't understand uh, and like you said I just started hearing terms over and over again. And it was to the point where I didn't even need to write it down because I had heard it hundreds of times that it was a word that was, you know, ingrained in my mind, but I didn't know what it was. And eventually either through context clues or just finding some time to go look it up. Um, I'd say I got 50% or more of the knowledge I have on elk hunting now, uh, just from podcast listening without having to go anywhere else for information. So talking about fly fishing, um, Maybe what is some of the 
gear. Let's go. Let's maybe go through some of the gear for fly fishing. Talking about like, um, you know, what's in a what's in a kit? Like a beginner, you know, okay, they're ready to ready to start building their kit. What are kind of the the bare bones basics that that someone needs to uh, start out fly fishing? Sure. And the something to cover first that's important for this is knowing oh, basically why you'd fly fish instead of spin fish, because okay. it does have a purpose and the gear is designed to uh, fill that fill that need. Um, so if you're spin See, fishing. This is me not knowing the correct questions to ask. I know <laughs> nothing about fly fishing. So I love this. So continue. <laughs> yeah, so if you're if you're spin fishing or bait casting or using any sort of like traditional gear, you've got some sort of heavy lure or like bait weight some something that when you cast out it's going to pull the line out which is why you can have very thin line but if you had um let's say just a a bare hook and tried to cast it with a spin rod it wouldn't go anywhere and i feel like most spin fishermen can can picture that at least um and although you can fly fish for pretty much anything you can spin fish for uh, most people associate it with trout and I think the reason for that is that trout tend to eat a lot of very small insects, which are what flies mimic. Um, they can mimic all sorts of things, but you know, most commonly, uh, caddisflies, stoneflies, and mayflies are the three big ones that they they imitate. And if you were to throw one of those flies on a spin rod and tried to cast it, it wouldn't go anywhere because the fly is so small and lightweight. So uh, for fly fishing, most people have seen the very like thick, often green or orange um, fly line. And that's that. That's the thick line that people are throwing back and forth over their heads. And instead of having the heavy lure to pull the line out, in fly fishing, the weighted line is used to pull the fly out. So you could think of it almost like throwing a lasso over your head, and that momentum is what's pulling the fly out. Um, and so to do that, you need a, a different set of gear than you can get away with spin fishing. Um, so does, does that all make sense so yeah, far? Yeah. Okay. So the basic gear is, you know, you still have a rod and reel, just the same as you would for spin fishing. It's obviously a little bit different. Uh, fly rods are often a little bit longer than spin rods. And a reel is, for the beginner angler, is mostly just there to hold the line. Um, you're doing a lot of the work with your hands with the line. So the reel's mostly just sitting there holding it. Um, so you've got your reel, you've got your fly line, which is the, the thick line that is heavy and pulls the fly out. You've got backing, which is, um, it's kind of like thread. It's, it's, um, I don't really know how to describe it, but it's, it's like a very thick thread and it connects the fly line to the fly reel because, uh, the fly line is so thick that if you were to have a whole reel of it, you wouldn't have very much of it before it filled up the reel. Hmm. Um, so that backing is there to give you, give your line extra length without filling up the reel with a very thick material. So it goes fly reel, then uh, usually 100 to 150 yards of backing, and then you've got your fly line tied to that. So that's all spooled up in the reel. And then at the end of your fly line, you have a leader. So that's, that's um, very similar to regular fishing line. It's tapered, so it, gets, it goes from thick to very, very thin at the end. Uh, and that is just to give you some space between the thick fly line and your fly, give you fly something to tie onto and so the fish aren't spooked by the by the line and then on that you've got uh tippet which is just essentially more um fishing line that you can tie to the end of your leader to make it longer or as it breaks off and gets shorter you can rebuild it and then you've got your fly which is just the equivalent of a lure for fly fishing and that is essentially like you've got all kinds of little gizmos like line cutters and things like that but if you wanted to walk out in the water that's what you'd need to have on you to go fly fishing Okay. That was, that's interesting. It's a lot more, you know, I mean, from an amateur's perspective, uh, it's a lot more complex of a setup than you would expect, you know, because once again, I've, you know, I've done real fishing my, my whole life. And, uh, you know, you just take your line and tie the whole thing up and, right. you know, you, you throw on your weight and, you know, how I, how I grew up fishing is, you know, you throw on your weights and your leader was pretty much the exact same line that you had on the rest of your reel and, um, you know, and threw some power bait on an, on a treble hook and that's about it. And you just sat there until something bit. Um, but yeah, that makes it, that all makes a lot of sense in the, you know, I guess in the context of, of what you're doing. Cause I was always a little bit curious about that. Cause I knew fly line was heavier. Um, how it, how you didn't go about basically the fish didn't 
see it sitting there on top of the water when the fly hits. Yeah. And I remember that as a kid, I would see people fly fishing and I was like, well, that's dumb because the fish can see that line. Like, yeah. <laughs> and so it wasn't until I saw a reel all set up and I was like, oh, everything on here makes perfect sense. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it just looking at the reel because it's all just reeled up in there. You only really see the fly line. So, so absolute bare bones basics. You need your, you basically need your reel, your rod and you know, with the line correctly set up and your fly, you can walk out into walk out into a stream and in theory catch a catch a fish. What's some other probably the the kind of the next level of gear that you're probably gonna probably gonna want to uh pick up before you uh, wander wander into a river with your <laughs> rod <laughs> reel? Yeah, that's like the bare bones and and plenty of companies sell that like as is. I and mean, you know, minus the fly on the end, but you can go out and get Usually they call them, you know, combos or outfits or whatever. And you can get a, a case that comes with all this stuff already pre-rigged, ready to fish. All you have to do is string it up and tie a fly on. But you're right, most most people are going to want more than just that. Just like <laughs> just like a gear fisherman is going to want more than just a hook and some bait. Like they're going to want some gizmos and things. Um, a lot of fly fishermen do wear waders. And I think that's mostly because it's often fishing for trout, which are in cold water, but obviously not needed if if you can handle the cold water or fishing for bass or pan fish you can just wear your you know whatever you'd wear during any other kind of fishing um but uh the other things that you'd probably need are some line nippers and hemostats just um kind of all-purpose pretty obvious why you why you want those to get hooks out and, and things like that uh, and then floatant, which is is more unique to fly fishing which is just uh if you're if you're fishing dry flies which are probably also something to address. There are different kinds of flies. Some float, they're called dry flies. Other ones go underwater. They'd be called wet flies or, you know, nymphs or streamers, depending on, on what exact type of fly it is. Um, but if you're fishing a dry fly, which floats, um, you'll want to have floatant, which is, it comes in a variety of different types, but it's basically used to keep the fly on the surface. So if it gets waterlogged and starts to sink, you put this stuff on and the fly will start to float again. Um, so that's more of a fly fishing specific aid uh, and then fly boxes to hold your flies most people carry some sort of pack either uh, like a hip pack or a chest pack that holds all their stuff um, and then apart from that it's just it's a, a lot of it is honestly gizmos that you don't need you know <laughs> they have they have like line straighteners and and this and that and it's all fun to have but every once in a while I see a product that I'm like that doesn't need to exist you know <laughs> <laughs> you can get away without that so apart from those things it's pretty much just what do you want? You what bells and whistles do you want? I wish I was at home and I could show you a, a picture of it. Um, but I have uh I, I can't remember if it was my granddad's or my great granddad's, uh, but an old one of the old, really old wicker uh fish uh fish baskets. A creel. Is that what it's called? I yeah. I've been told a million times and it just doesn't <laughs> stick. But yeah, an old wicker creel and uh then I've got the the fly box, the little uh, green metal fly box on the leather belt that opens up. And uh, um, I can't remember who exactly it belonged to, but I'll have to send you a picture of it next time I'm next time I'm back or I'll post one up here. Um, but yeah, I've been I've been wanting to go find a place to get that uh, get that refurbished and because it's a really cool piece for the for the shelf. But uh, yeah, that's kind of a fun aspect of fly fishing is kind of the historical side and, you know, inheriting your your granddad's gear or something like that. Like there's, you know, as much as a lot of anglers want like the newest and best gear, like there's also a subset of people that really gravitates toward that that old stuff. It still works, you know, people are still fishing with their dad's or granddad's stuff. So um, got gear sorted out, I guess, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, first steps in learning to fly fish at this point is you probably need to learn to cast. <laughs> yes. That's, I'm assuming that's, that's probably <laughs> a pretty critical uh, step into learning this whole fly fishing thing. So maybe, uh, maybe break down, break down casting for us a little bit. Uh, obviously, you know, it's a little bit hard without being able to demo, demo everything I'm sure, but uh, kind of maybe break down casting and how the best way for someone to go, go about learning that. Sure. So like I said, the best way to learn is probably to get the terminology down and then to go watch a video. Um, if you can get someone to teach you hands-on, that's obviously going to be 
the best, but I can, I'll do my best to kind of break down how the cast works. Um, there's, there's kind of two, I would say two tiers of learning the cast in terms of, um, you know, you've seen people go back and forth with the line in the air over and over again. And I think there's a big misconception among people who have never touched a fly rod that that portion of the cast is when you're actually fishing. You know, the, some people think the, the fish jumps up out of the water to grab the fly while it's in the air. Some people <laughs> think, I mean, I don't know. There's a whole, there's a whole wide variety of, of what people view the cast as. And that portion in the air is, is really just the cast and getting the fly to where you want it to be. Um, and you're not actually fishing until you're done with that portion. But that is not necessary for the first couple times you go out. Um, a lot of the, f- the first couple times is just making one cast back, one cast forward, and letting the fly sit on the water. Uh, and it's not until you're more comfortable with that that you would move up to how I like to think of as tier two, where you're actually keeping the line in the air um, a bit longer and making longer casts to more precise locations. Um, and honestly, keeping the line in the air too long is a big problem because it's very visible, you know, to fish might see the shadow going back and forth or might see the line. So ideally you can get your cast done quickly without having to do much of that back and forth. And that's called false casting when you're going back and forth like that. So essentially you've got, say you've got your line on the water, you're going to pick your rod up and they say a lot of people reference between 10 and two, and you'll, if you've ever watched like a river runs through it, you'll hear that. Um, but when you're first starting out, it's, it's more like 10 to noon. Um, okay. And your ride will be stopping right above your head. And that is to get the line to fly out behind you. That's, that's called the back cast. So the back cast is when you're bringing your rod back, the line's flying back behind you. And the forward cast is when you're bringing it back forward, kind of getting ready to lay the line out to present it to the fish. Um, and so on that back cast, you're doing what's called loading the rod. And that's just where the weight of that line is coming back and kind of, it's almost like bouncing the rod backward so it can then fling back forward. Um, and so a lot of the power comes from the back cast. You throw your line back, it puts a lot of power into the rod itself. And then when you bring it forward, all that pent up energy is going to launch your, your line and therefore your fly out onto the water. So once you stop your rod at noon, you're going to have to pause for a little bit to allow the line to fly out behind you. And that's a big uh, mistake a lot of beginners make is not waiting for that pause because they're so used to throwing line forward that it seems counterintuitive to spend so much of your time with the line behind you fly fishing. So you got to wait for that line to load. And once it is fully straightened out and you can, you can watch it happen if you turn your head around, then you'll do the forward cast where you bring your rod roughly to about 10 o'clock, that'll shoot the line out forward. Um, If you're just starting out, you may just go ahead and lay the line down right then. If you're false casting, you may bring it back and let a little bit of line out each time until you've got as much line as you want to send out, and then you can let it lay down the water on whichever forward cast you're ready. So it's really, I mean, the whole purpose, you know, because, yeah, you see it in all the in all the videos, all the movies, you know, they're flying back and forth and back and forth like nine times before the uh, fly ever actually goes out there. And really, I mean, I guess the what the purpose of that is to just make sure you're letting out a precise amount of line or is there. Yeah, so that's that's just to because each time you go back and forward, you can let a little bit of line slip out. So you're you're usually holding the line in your non-dominant hand. Let's say you're casting with your right hand, you're holding that line in your your left hand, which is why I said the reel is kind of just there to to hold the extra. And every time you come forward, you're just letting a little bit of line slip through your fingers. Uh, and the better you get, the fewer casts it's going to take you to get all that line out. So say I'm starting with ten feet of line at the end of my rod, but I want to cast. 40 feet, it's going to take a couple casts to get that out. But someone who's just starting out, it might take them 10 casts to do that. Someone who's been doing it for years might be able to do it in one or two casts. And the fewer casts you make, the better in general. And I think that's something to just to kind of reiterate what you said, that's, that's very different than spin reel casting. Because like, the line's not, you're not throwing it out. The line's not like pulling off your reel. It's you pull that out first, correct? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you pull out as much line as you think you'll want to use, or usually more is better because if you, if you reach the end of your line, more isn't going to come out of the reel and it's just going to kind of like bounce, you know, it's going to hit the end, bounce back and you're going to 
pile up on the water in kind of a, a sloppy cast. So I usually have uh, a couple feet more out of the reel than I plan to cast. And by the end, you can have a little bit dangling down and it's, it's not a problem to have an extra foot or two of line out, out of the reel just in your hand. Um, and you can just use that line to, to work the cast. Um, if you get a fish on, you can, you can let the line slide in and out of your fingers before using the drag on the reel. Like, especially for smaller fish, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the quote unquote reeling in is actually done with your hand. Um, and you know, if you get a large fish that takes all that line and suddenly is on the reel, then now you can use the reel. But for most, for most small trout situations, you're just using the, your hand to manage the line. That always, I always thought that was interesting because that just looks like a nightmare to me. Cause you watch these guys and they're just like, you know, just ripping this line out before they cast. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that just looked, I'm like, I would do that. And I would go to cast and it would just be a giant knot. I don't like that. <laughs> That was the one thing I was like, how does it, is that ever really an issue or is the line just heavy enough to where it, it doesn't tangle up, tangle up like that so much? So the leader, which is like closer to regular fishing line, definitely gets tangled just as much as regular fishing line. And it's just as annoying to get out. Um, I'd say fly line doesn't, doesn't knot up as much. Um, and when it does, it's usually not hard to get out because it's so thick and it's, it's rubbery. So it doesn't usually tie into really tight knots or anything. The, the one thing that does happen that's really annoying that does not happen in spin fishing is that when you have a lot of extra line out, especially if you've cast a lot of line and now you're pulling it back in and it's building up, is it can like fall onto the ground, get caught in willows or weeds. Uh, you might step on it. It might get wrapped around a leg. So you do have to be a little bit conscious of what your line's doing when it's not in the reel because it can, go, it can kind of go wild at your feet. I can almost imagine that would kind of be a a difficulty and a benefit of fishing in the middle of like a moving river to where it's you're you're pulling out all that line and if you if you do it right it's nice and it pulls it kind of behind you and keeps it keeps it out versus if you're you know doing it wrong you're (laughs) you're throwing it out in front of you it's getting tangled around your legs it's getting bunched up and causing all kinds of a nightmare but yeah and in a river it's not like if you're actually wading out, it's it's usually not as big a problem because the line floats, so it'll just float mm-hmm. there on the water. Um, when it really sucks is when you're on shore, especially if you're around like little like shrubs or or willows, because oh, yeah. then it's just like sitting on the ground and getting tangled on anything or like on your pack, all the things that are like dangling off your pack, it'll get wrapped around that. So actually, like standing out in the middle of a lake or river is probably the safest time for your fly line. <laughs> So, uh, what are some of, what are some of the other basics that someone should uh, really needs to learn before they uh, before they're ready to go out and and start fishing for whatever they want to fish for? Uh, there's not. I, I mean, I think that's like a really good foundation, um, and a lot of a lot of stuff after that is just stuff you learn as you go. I'd say the things to know apart from that um, are things like I said that you learn spin fishing. A lot of it is just knowing where a trout might sit, and you know, if you've got decades of of trout fishing with a spin rod, you've, you're already set. Like you're already, you know, well ahead of the ahead of the pack in that in that department. But um, other than that, I would say learning the different fly types and what each one is used for. There's a lot of uh, entomology. So knowing the different, like the life cycles of the insects and, you know, when insects hatch and what, what fly you'd use for each situation, that's something to learn. Um, and then the different, the different techniques for fishing each of those flies, you know, for example, a dry fly floats on the surface. It's imitating usually an adult insect, like a mayfly who's just come to the surface and is ready to fly away. Um, so getting, for example, a dead drift, which is when you just have your fly float at the exact same speed as the current, that's a technique that is is pretty vital to know and then all the little variations within that so um keeping your line off the water enough that you're not getting caught and getting drag uh but like i said a lot of this stuff is um i wouldn't really call it basic you know basic is getting your fly out there making sure your line is is laying down nicely um and after that a lot of it is things you're going to need to dive in for but you'll have enough knowledge by that point if you can cast the fly and get it on the water and get in position um, for catching a fish at that point you can go into a fly shop and say like I want more help with this specific technique but I would say just learning the different flies what each one's used for and the a couple of the basic techniques for each of those uh, styles of fly I'd say are the next steps to learn so one of the things that it's it's funny it all it kind of brings out the I want to say you're gonna laugh at the old Dungeons and Dragons nerd in me (laughs) is and 
it's like this weird combination of of two things for me is like the time time flies like getting into that whole thing and i'm sure there's you know that's a whole different podcast on its own but um you know just because it's i i always love this stuff i always, always loved reloading ammo i love building my own arrows and i just know if i start fly fishing that's something i i would love to do but it just it reminds me so much of like when i you know used to paint like little miniature characters for my dungeons and dragons <laughs> games um but like i feel like i could totally nerd out on the creative aspect of time flies as well as you know just that that really detailed process uh process aspect of it and you know it ties into my other passion too so i just it's, i'm almost a little bit of a, afraid because i definitely do not have the bandwidth to start I barely have, like, I'm not sure I have it to learn fly fishing, let alone start tying flies right now. But, uh, so I think I'm going to stick with picking up, uh, when I, whenever I pick this up, I'm going to stick with just picking up some pre-tied flies from the store, but maybe, uh, you know, somebody who's looking to build their kit, uh, you know, obviously, yeah, where they're going to be fishing, um, is going to have a lot of effect on that. But if someone's trying to build kind of a versatile, a versatile kit where that, you know, if they're going hunting, they're going on vacation and they want to kind of fly fish, what are maybe some of the flies that they should pick up and, and maybe kind of talk about why those flies would be, uh, would be, or a situation those flies would work in. Sure. So, I mean, I, like you said, it does depend a lot on where you're going and what you're fishing for, but I would say it depends more on what you're fishing for. Um, a trout fly is a trout fly and yeah, there's different hatches in different areas of the country, but um, trout flies, a lot of them have very similar characteristics and something that works in one place will very likely work just as fine somewhere else. So I'd say if it, what matters more is, for example, a bass fly is going to be pretty different than a trout fly. And bass flies, a lot of them are kind of similar to what you'd use um, with gear fishing. They're obviously made out of things like feathers and thread and stuff, but you're still mimicking the same things. You're mimicking small bait fish a lot of the time. So you might find something that looks very similar to like a Rapala, but it's just made out of, you know, feathers instead of plastic. Uh, but I think more people are probably trying to get into fly fishing for trout. So I think those flies would be a little bit more uh, relevant to, to cover. Uh, like I said, the three main categories of, of small flies are mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. Uh, and there's also, for trout, you can still use, obviously, like bait fish and things like that. And so that'd be more in the streamer category. Uh, it, there's only one streamer that I think needs to be in the box of every fly fisherman, regardless of uh, skill level. And that would be just a like a black or olive woolly bugger. So that's going to work. It's going to have luck pretty much anywhere in the country on any any water. And that one would be great for bass and trout. So I would say if you're getting into it, you should definitely have a couple of those in your box. And they're just fun but, to say. Right. <laughs> you can just tell everyone you've got some. <laughs> but I feel like most streamers probably that's that's probably not what you're going to get started with your first couple times fly fishing. So, you know, have a couple of woolly buggers in your box and then the the smaller flies which are usually imitating things like insects. Uh, you're going to have your nymphs and your dry flies. So nymphs are imitating the immature stages of an insect. So it might be like a pupa, um, and it's going to it's going to sink. It's often going to have like a bead to keep it to keep it down, so more weight. And then dry flies are going to have basically a little extra fluff to keep them floating on the surface. And they're going to imitate the dun and spinner stages of a of an insect, which is just where they're coming up hatching often mating and then dying and falling back to the water um so for nymphs for trout there's you know there's hundreds and hundreds of different ones out there and a lot of them have very unique names and very specific recipes but uh a couple there's a handful that i would say are kind of a a surefire option anywhere you go and those would be like a pheasant tail a hare's ear a copper john a prince nymph and a, a zebra midge um, and there's there's more too, of course, but I would say those five, they should be in every single person's box. Um, and that'll cover your mayflies, your stoneflies, your caddisflies, as well as your midges, um, which in, in some water, midges make up like 90% of what trout are eating. Um, and they work year round. So uh, I would say for nymphs, those are probably the, the five that everyone should have. And in terms of dry flies, um, it does depend a little bit on where you are and what exactly is hatching. But a lot of flies 
kind of mimic a, a wide variety of things. So I guess I should have mentioned this before, but some flies are, are mimicking something very specific. So like this specific species of insect, you know, down to the color and the shape and everything. And then other flies are, you know, they have attractor patterns and search patterns and things. And those are more mimicking a group of insects. So, you know, this is a mayfly pattern versus this is a, you know, a blue winged olive mayfly pattern. Oh, interesting. And so I think it, most of what I listed in the nymphs are kind of more general. You know, it doesn't mimic a specific insect. It, it mimics, or a specific species, I should say. It mimics a, a specific group. So this is a mayfly nymph versus a, a BWO mayfly nymph. Um, and then same for dry flies. Uh, some common ones are like a, an elk hair caddis. So it's, it's basically just a tuft of elk hair tied on the hook. And that mimics most adult mayfly, or, um, sorry, most adult caddis um, flies. And then uh, like a parachute atoms is kind of a really good all around mayfly, um, dry fly, uh, BWO dries, blue winged olive. That's a more specific one, but again, pretty useful year round in a lot of places. And then an adult, adult midge pattern too. So like a Griffith snout would be a great one for that. Um, and those would be, like I said, can be used pretty much anywhere. They can be used on bluegill as well. So if you're getting started with that, it can kind of get you from bluegill the whole way into trout. It, it, and it almost seems like the kind of thing where, okay, you, uh, you know, you, you put together your basic setup and then, you know, when you're going somewhere, I mean, you know, most anywhere you're going to be fly fishing, there's probably a, a local tackle, tackle shop somewhere around there. And I'm assuming it's probably one of those things where you can go in and, you know, talk to them about whatever the, I don't know, local insects are and, you know, what the fish are biting on. And they'll probably give you some tips on, on what to pick up if it's not already in your kit. For sure. And that's where the, the fly shop comes in really handy. And a lot of them will also post online fishing reports. So um, most major waters in their area, they'll have uh, just a post online that is usually updated every couple of days that says what's hatching and, and which flies are good um, for mimicking that that particular hatch and then the different sizes and things like that so but yeah you can also go in um usually it's good courtesy to you know buy a couple things when you're in there but that often comes from just if you don't have the flies you need you just buy those flies from them and they're they're going to be happy to tell you what to use in hopes that you're going to you know, buy those <laughs> flies from them yeah it's just good business <laughs> right <laughs> same with like you know telling people where to go fish you know if you're going to keep coming back into that shop it's it's kind of a mutual relationship there um, but there's also, a, you know, apart from specific rivers and getting the specific flies that are good on that river, you can also just go online and look up hatch charts. So, you know, I know that, you know, caddis flies hatch in the evenings through the summer in Colorado. So I don't usually need to go into a fly shop to ask that. It's just something I know. And the more you do it, the more you'll, you'll get used to. It's kind of like knowing when the elk rut happens. You know, it's okay. just, you get used to it. And you can just look those up for any area. So is there... Uh... Is there anything we really haven't haven't talked about? Anything that that somebody new to fly fishing should really know, should learn? Uh, this is me asking the questions I don't know to ask. <laughs> um, I would say that what we've covered so far is in like if you if you take the time to go learn the terminology and everything, a couple of the names, of the techniques that going to a fly shop at that point is probably your next best bet to have someone show you how to cast but in terms of just general kind of theory stuff that is is good to have in the back of your mind when you're when you're talking to somebody about fly fishing is um like one of them for example is a lot of people think that the fly is kind of the be all end all in terms of whether you're going to catch a fish and a lot of times what is more important is changing up the technique so not just being familiar with the different flies, but being familiar with all the different options for techniques uh, is very important. And a lot of times changing the technique will completely change your day of fishing without having to change flies. And uh, some people really geek out about learning the hatches and exactly what fly to use at exactly what time. And I'm, I'm more of the style, like I've got my favorite flies that I like fishing and I will change my techniques until they work. Like I, I prefer just sticking with my favorites and, and making them work. And I think a lot of people going in get a little too, too um, concerned about the fly selection and things like that, when really a lot of it's just experimentation and getting used to all the different techniques and seeing what works. Um, I feel like I can almost relate that to elk calling, like where you're in the woods where it's like, you know, you got all kinds of different people and they have all different strategies where some guys 
they're focused on like all the details, all the little nuances and different types of calls and everything else. Then you've got other guys, which are like, I just challenge every, I just challenge people every single <laughs> elk I hear. Um, and obviously I am on my elk hunt right now. So this is what I'm equating everything to, For sure. but it's, it sounds like a very similar thing to where it's like, okay, you know, you can go to the extremes on either side. You can have a combination of the both. There is, it's very much like a, uh, both sides kind of complement each other and you have to figure out where your balance lies. Yeah, I think I've heard like Corey Jacobson talk about that. Like some people are like, you call too much. And he's like, well, I only want to, I only want to go for the ones that are willing to play, you know, yeah. like that's just what he likes to do. And I think that's a very important part of fly fishing and something that doesn't get talked about a lot is that, you know, everyone's looking for something different. Some people want to catch like the biggest fish and you might need to use a very specific technique and fly in a very specific location to make that happen. Other people are just having fun being out there. So, you know, why sweat it? Just go out and, and have fun. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think going into a fly shop, talking to someone there, um, letting them know what you're looking for, or if you're on a guided trip, that's really important too, to tell the guide what you want from the trip. Because you know, if I go out with a guide, I would like to hopefully catch a couple fish, but mostly learn something and and have a good time, um, have some opportunities, and that, and that's not what everyone's looking for. So I think being honest with what you're looking for, and then catering what you're learning to what you're looking for is, is probably the best bet after that. So, I mean, we don't have to go into like super in-depth detail. Cause I'm sure again, you know, you could probably do a podcast on each of the techniques in and of themselves. Um, but what are, what are maybe some of them, like, you know, we talked about the different types of flies. What are some of the different like techniques that you talk about? Because, you know, it, me coming into it, I'm like, I don't know, man. You just talked about throwing the fly out there. Fly hits the water, the fish bite it. What else? What else is there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, f so I'll, I'll categorize the flies right now very generally into the three main categories of dry flies, nymphs, and streamers. And you know, there's there's subsets within those, of course, but um, those three. And I'll kind of pick apart. Uh, I would say one of the most common techniques for each one. Um, so for dry flies, like I said, it's just the dead drift, and that's that's. I would say dry flies are probably one of the most simple flies to fish because there's not a lot of different things you can do with them. They're, they're mostly there to imitate an insect that's caught in the current and is floating downstream. So the, the main goal of fishing a dry fly is to keep it from looking unnatural on the surface. And unnatural usually means that it's floating at a different speed or direction than the current because no insect is going to be able to you know swim against the current <laughs> as it's floating downstream. So basically you're doing your best to keep as much fly line as you can off the water because it's so it has such a, a big profile i guess and it's it's heavy enough that it gets caught in the current very easily and if it gets caught in the current it's going to start to drag the fly with it and it's the fly is going to move at an, an unnatural pace and fish will turn their nose up at it so the dead drift is basically keeping as much fly line as you can off the water um and then mending which is that's more of an advanced technique but you're you're tossing your line back and forth, either upstream or downstream, to keep the fly line moving at the same speed as the fly. Um, basically doing everything in your power to keep the fly from moving across the surface at any other speed or direction than the current of the river. Hmm. Um, and in a lake, obviously, that's not a thing because there's no current. So you're just kind of letting your dry fly sit there, maybe giving it a twitch every now or then um, just to look like an insect. But I, I'd say on both rivers and lakes, dry flies are fairly simple. It's just make the fly look like it's it's floating without much action uh the i would say one of the most common techniques for nymphing is indicator nymphing and a lot of people will say it's a bobber and it is kind of a bobber uh but i i still say indicator because it is it's not the red plastic bobber that most people are used to it's usually a small uh either piece of plastic full of air or a piece of yarn or a piece of fluff um and it's just there to do exactly what a bobber is there to do and let you know if something has, has taken your fly under the surface. Um, and you're usually dead drifting that as well. So you would cast out your indicator, which is positioned partway up your leader. The nymph is underwater and you can't see it. And you're waiting for the indicator to um, either bounce a little bit or drag in a different direction, which lets you know that there's something under your line. And that's when you set the hook. Um, but you're still, you're still moving your indicator at the same speed as the current, just like a dry fly would be. Uh, and then the last technique, which can be used for streamers, um, can also be used for for nymphs in a lake, especially, is called stripping. So just like the woolly bugger, fun to fun to talk <laughs> about. <laughs> uh, 
and that's just the equivalent of like reeling a, a like a lure back in if you're spin fishing again you're you're doing it with your hands because you're not really using the reel but you're just pulling that line back in and that's going to pull the streamer which is imitating a bait fish usually and um, that's going to make the fish look like it's swimming with an with a nymph in a lake you might be pulling uh, a small a small you know mayfly or stonefly underneath the water back toward you and it just looks like a little um nymph that's kind of darting through the water and in that case you'll just feel the take and set the hook just like you would if you felt a, a bass hit a lure okay so those are kind of kind of the general the most common techniques someone would use with each of those different types of flies and you know and as you said as as you get more into it get more advanced you can start learning additional techniques and uh for sure okay yeah, but those are the three that you should, I would say those are definitely the first three techniques you should learn. And I would, I would say also that most of the other techniques are, are under one of those umbrellas. You know, you might still be dead drifting a, a dry fly, but you might give it a, a, like, skate, you might skate it over the water a little bit to make it look like a bug that's trying to fly away. But it still probably started with a dead drift, you know. Okay, and yeah, and I'm sure just like with anything as you get into it you'll see different situations you'll see how the fish are responding what they're responding to you're able to adjust no pun intended on the fly yeah um <laughs> i was about to say it i'm like oh gosh that's bad um, <laughs> as long as you acknowledge that uh, that you said it <laughs> yeah uh you can adjust on the fly uh you know to the situation and yeah i guess that that's stuff that just comes with experience and you know building on you can't expect to go out there and I mean, like me with elk hunting, like half of the time I'm like, okay, my plan didn't work. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have no, I have no idea what to do now. So, so then I researched that I talk to people and then next time I go out, if that situation, you know, when that situation happens, I, I know something else to try, try then. And, uh, it's just keep building on what you know, every time you can't expect to have all the knowledge the first time you go out. Right. And kind of also relating to elk hunting, like you said, elk calling, there's also going to be times where you don't need to do everything right. And a fish is still going to play along, you know, like in general, trout don't want poorly presented flies and just, you know, the same way that an elk doesn't want to come into a, a really terrible call, but there's always that one that <laughs> <laughs> just wants to help you out. So, you know, you probably get lucky doing the wrong thing plenty of times. Well, I really hope that's the case on that trip, this trip, uh, but that's a different story. Because, <laughs> I don't know, people have seen my calling on Instagram. Um, oh, yeah, I watched the car videos. Oh, man, it's they, it has gotten significantly better than that, but that's not saying a lot. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, I want to uh, have you talk a little bit about your blog. You have a blog, uh, Fish Untamed. Uh, where can people find that? So that's just at fishuntamed.com. And I'm only on really Instagram and, and Go Wild. Uh, although on Go Wild, I'm just under my name, but uh, Fish Untamed on Instagram and the website. And I mostly just cover backcountry fly fishing. I, I, I try to have a range of stuff, but I'd say the general theme of it is backcountry. Um, so I also talk about, you know, backpacking setups and, and things like that, going lightweight. Uh, but yeah, so I, I post once a week. Um, on a variety of topics, always open to suggestions as well about what people want. I try to do some recipes and conservation stuff as well. I'm just kind of an all-around fly fishing topic. Awesome. And there is some other exciting news uh, <laughs> that I'd love to have you announce uh, here on the podcast. And uh, people will be hearing a, a little bit extra coming from you. Uh, I'm thinking when this comes out, I'm assuming it'll, it'll be later this week. Hopefully, yeah. Um, <laughs> if we, if I can get my schedule <laughs> sorted and we can get our timing worked out. Yeah, so I am, I've, I've already recorded a couple episodes, but starting a podcast and joining in with you on your network. So um, if anyone has been wanting to try fly fishing, which I assume a lot of people who have, who've hunt have thought maybe I could just throw a rod in my backpack and take it out. And that's one of the great things about it is very packable and you can easily throw a rod in your backpack that you're taking out hunting and, and spend midday when you normally take a nap, you know, catching some dinner or something. So, um, to that actually really quick to that note, and we'll, we'll hop back to the podcast discussion, but how much like, you know, your bare bones tackle, like something you would take on a backcountry hunt. I'm sure there's like, there's also like ultra lightweight rods and stuff, but you know, somebody that's like, yeah, I do want to go hunting, but I'm like, 
but I've just been elk hunting for a week and every ounce hurts me. So like what, you know, what kind of weight are we looking at? Do you think for like a, a fairly lightweight backcountry rod setup? I've honestly never weighed my stuff and I'm, I'm not knowledgeable on, you know, the specs okay. of a lot of my, like I'm not a big gear head, uh, but uh, I do have some stuff to say about it. One is that fly gear in general is pretty lightweight and most manufacturers, I'd say for rods, it, there's not much of a difference. You know, you might be talking half ounces difference. Um, for reels, you can, you can, on most manufacturers' websites, they'll have the weight of the reel and they'll, they'll usually make a reel or two that is a little more bare bones. And for, for trout, what most hunters are going to have access to, you don't need anything large. You can get, uh, I, I guess this, this, this is a topic I could have brought up earlier, but um, rods come in different weights and it's not weight, like how much it weighs, but uh, like a one weight, it goes from like one to, I want to say 12 to 15, somewhere up in there. And a one weight rod is what you'd use for like the very, very tiniest, tiniest fish. I don't, it, it's not a very commonly used weight. A five weight is kind of a standard trout rod. Um, but for most of the smaller trout in the back country, you can get away with a three to four weight rod. And so that's going to be smaller and lighter than something big that you'd use on, you know, marlin or bonefish or tarpon. And the reels that go with those weight rods are going to be pretty lightweight. So you're not going to have to worry too much about cutting down on weight. Um, one option that you can do, though, and a lot of people don't consider it fly fishing, but I don't see why we need to, you know, break it down to what, what the definition is. <laughs> but you can get a tankara rod. Um, and tankara is just a traditional Japanese style of fly fishing. And it's, it's almost like a, like a cane rod where you just have the line tied directly to the end of the rod there's no reel and but you still can do the back cast and everything um and it's it's great for flies the rods are often 10 to 12 feet long and so you don't have to um you you can get your line way out there without doing a lot of casting you can kind of just dip your line in um and that because it doesn't have a reel which is kind of the heavy part of any setup you can throw the 10 car rod in a backpack and it's just going to be a couple extra ounces to your pack hmm so, so with that, you know, you still, you still have a decent length of line, but it's a longer rod. So it's not quite as much as you would, as you'd normally have. And you're still doing the same thing. You're still, uh, what's the term? Backloading? Uh, uh, back casting or, back or casting. False, false casting. Yeah. You're still kind of loading that line and, and getting it out there, but, it, and, and you can still move it in a fairly similar way. You just don't, it's just not, the line's not going in and out as much. Right. So you won't be false casting back and forth and back and forth because you don't need to let any line out because you can't let any line out. It's a fixed set of line, but you, you'll still bring it back and bring it forward to you'll load the rod and shoot the line out there. But because there's no real, you're set at the, the same distance of line every time. So there's no real like line management with your hands. You're just kind of tossing it out there and then managing the fly once it's on the water. Okay. Gosh, this podcast is dangerous because I'm in Montana right now. And I mean, you know, great fly fishing out here. And I, I knew this would be a problem the second I recorded this, that I'm, <laughs> I'm going to want to go out to a fly shop and, and pick up a rod and reel and throw it in the pack with me. But anyway. Oh, and something um, else I should mention on that note, something else to mention is that fly fishing is not as expensive as people make it sound. It can be. Um, but you can get, like I said, a combo, you know, rigged up, ready to fish. All you need to do is tie a fly on. You can get that for under 150 bucks. You can probably find them for oh. under 100, 100 bucks if you if you want to go a little lower quality. But there's no reason to spend a bunch of money when you're just getting started. Um, so I would say look for some of those combos for 150 bucks or well, less. And I'm sure if like you go on, you know, Facebook Marketplace has those local groups and stuff. You go on something like that. I mean, I'm or Craigslist. I'm sure there's tons of people that were like i wanted to pick up fly fishing oh crap this isn't for me right <laughs> here's a rod i've used twice you know whole everything's already set up for you you know you could, probably can get a whole kit there for i mean half of probably what they paid for it or three quarters of what they paid for it yeah and and the good thing is too those those rods that you get you know obviously it's fun to upgrade and get something a little nicer mm -hmm. but i still have the very first rod and reel i bought and i still use it all the time and it works just fine like you don't need the top of the line stuff. It's fun to upgrade when you've got, you know, when you know you like it and you, you want to play around a little bit more with customizing your setup, but um, there's no need to spend a ton of money. And it's not like you have to get rid of your old rod and never use it again because it's, you know, old and crappy. Like they'll still, they'll still catch fish. And at the end of the day, it's mostly on you, not on the gear. Like when people are blaming their gear for messing <laughs> up, like it's just that you're not, you're not doing well with it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, but we all know that it's my, 
elk bugle tube it's, that's yeah, the reason I'm not seeing anything. Right. You got to buy a new one. <laughs> exactly. Because I don't already have like five of them. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah, but people will be uh, coming up now. Uh, people will be hearing from you um, uh, weekly on the on the Wild Initiative podcast as well. I'm excited that uh, we're going to be adding some f- really cool fly fishing content uh, to the podcast because it's it's you know something that I'm not at all versed in. Obviously, as people have gotten the gist from this episode. <laughs> Um, and I think it's something that people are really interested in and there's just not, I mean, there's information if you know where to look, but for someone new to it, it's not as easily accessible. So I'm really excited to, you know, have you sharing all this information on the podcast. Yeah. And I hope it can kind of work the same way. Like I, like we mentioned earlier, where I just was listening to hunting podcasts and I just kind of learned over time, like it wasn't hunting season, but you know, in the other you know, eight months of the year, whatever, I was just picking up information. By the time it came around, I felt a lot more well-versed. So hopefully it doesn't require much extra effort on people's parts to learn anything because they'll be hearing about it, you know, over time. And then at some point they'll probably realize like, wow, I know more about this than I thought I did. Mm -hmm. And I also mentioned to you recently that I probably will do a little bit of non-fly fishing specific, at least topics. You know, I might be talking about conservation and, um, you know, fish ecology and behavior and stuff like that and uh we'll very likely also have people on that are not fly fishermen but i'd say the majority of it will be will be fly fishing related oh yeah i think you know and, and i think i think that's great because fishing is just one of those things that complements hunting so well and it's you know i grew up doing it and i love it uh and i think it's something that everybody really enjoys uh i don't think there's anyone out there that's like oh i hate going fishing <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> i mean at least no one that i want to be friends with right because uh, you can make it as like casual or hardcore as you want like you can hike 20 miles back in and climb mountains to catch fish or you can just like sit on the dock with your friends and drink a beer like there's there's not like a level that you have to attain to make it fishing so exactly so we already uh so people can find you at uh, fishuntamed.com can find you at Fish Untamed on Instagram and Katie Berger on Go Wild. And then keep an eye out for the podcast here on the Wild Initiative coming up. Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. Well, any uh, when the way I always like to end this, and you all phrase it a little bit differently, uh, you know, somebody, somebody listens to the podcast and they're like, I don't know, this whole thing sounds pretty complicated. I don't know if I can do this, you know, what, what words of encouragement would you give them? Uh, If you spend two hours online, diligently looking up the basics of fly fishing, you will no longer feel like it is out of your reach. I would say it's just that most people have not spent very much time actually looking into what it is, but it does not take, it takes, it takes an afternoon on Google, just grab a beer, watch some videos and you will feel 10 times better about it than you do right now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, sitting down and chatting today. I'm excited to uh, let everyone learn a bit about fly fishing. Yeah, same here. (laughs) All right, y'all, that'll do it for episode 120 of The Wild Initiative. Make sure y'all head on over to the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com slash 120. Check out links to everything we talked about in today's episode. Make sure y'all head on over, check out Katie's blog at fishuntamed.com, as well as tune in in the upcoming weeks as Katie starts releasing her podcast. If y'all want to follow along with my hunt, make sure y'all head on over to thewildinitiative.com slash go wild. Download the app, check out my profile, and hopefully by the time y'all are listening to this, I'll have an awesome post and some tracking about killing a really big bull. Well, y'all, that's it for now. I'm excited to talk to y'all again next week. But until then, I hope this podcast inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more.